Since business rescue proceedings entered the South African legal landscape, it has occupied the attention of the courts and recent financial collapses of several prominent businesses has also now fixed the media's attention on business rescue. The objective of today's discussion is to highlight some of the shortcomings of our current framework and encourage dialogue for policy design and law reform initiatives. I'm Unita Collins. I'm the head of the Department of Mercantile Law at the University of Johannesburg. And this webinar is also being presented by the Department of Mercantile Law in collaboration with the UJ Library. Before I introduce the panelists, I would like to cover a few housekeeping notes. If you have any questions, please post them in the chat box, the Q&A box, and we will get through as many of them as possible. I am however sensitive to the time constraints of our participants, as I know that we are all very busy at this time of the year. The format of today's webinar will be that I will give a short introduction, I will try and be very brief, and then my panelists will discuss certain practical considerations, challenges, and some proposals. And as time permits, we will then also entertain some of the questions. Before we start, I now want to introduce our Executive Dean, Professor Vessel Domingo, and invite her to say a few words. Thank you, uh, Juanita. Ladies and gentlemen, colleagues and friends, good morning. As introduced, I am Wissal Domingo, the Dean of the Faculty of Law. And so on behalf of the Faculty of Law, it gives me great pleasure to welcome you to today's webinar, which Juanita has mentioned, 10 years of business rescue, some lessons for the future, a decade of business, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Now, for many of you, the good and the bad and the ugly, for some of us that's very old, there's a Western movie as well. But we will see what today's um, discussions will hold. So as the flyer indicates, um, business rescue proceedings um, in South Africa has occupied our courts, as Juanita has indicated. We've had many prominent businesses that has closed or collapsed, and this has drawn the media's attention to um, business rescue. So we have various experts who will discuss the challenges and opportunities associated with business rescue. And I in particular look forward to the recommendations around law reform. So I have no doubt that we will have a robust and interesting engagements today. So on behalf of the Faculty of Law, I want to thank our panelists for making time available in their busy schedules. We have advocate Lizelle Acker from the Johannesburg Society of Advocates, Lero Todi, Mahali from Cliff Decker, and from our own faculty here at UJ, we have Professor Kathleen Van Delinda. Once again, panelists, many thanks. We know how busy you are, particularly this time of the year. Our moderator today, as he was introduced, is Professor Juanita Carlitz, who is the HOD for Mercantile Law Department. So Juanita, I want to extend a heartfelt thank you to you for putting together this timely webinar on business rescue. Thank you for doing that. I know it takes a lot of time and effort. And so to our technical team, our marketing team, and in particular, the library as well, thank you very much. I'm not gonna say much today, but in conclusion, thank you to the attendees for to attending today's event. I'm sure you're all looking forward to the, the discussion. So without further ado, I'm going to hand back to you, Juanita. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Domingo. I really appreciate your time. And um, before I hand over to the panelists, I have a few general remarks regarding business rescue. Since the 1st of May, 2011, the Companies Act 2008 has created a business rescue regime that enables distressed companies to alleviate the pressure brought upon them by creditors demanding payments of the debts owing to them. Several insolvency related measures have been implemented worldwide to mitigate the economic consequences of the COVID-19 pandemic. However, in contrast, as yet, no emergency law reform measures directly related to the field of insolvency or business rescue have been implemented by the South African government. Internationally, there is a general recognition that efficient and effective insolvency and restructuring systems 
are an essential part of financial designs needed to underpin investment and economic growth. And in the words of the uh, General Counsel of the World Bank, she stated, well-designed legal and regulatory frameworks with respect to insolvency and creditor debtor rights facilitate the extension of credit and enable private sector development. The availability of credit is a key driver of economic activity, innovation and growth. By providing for the restructuring and preservation of distressed yet viable businesses and providing alternatively for the ordinary resolution of distressed non-viable businesses, insolvency laws and restructuring laws offer predictability and enhances investor confidence. Overall, the transparency and effect efficiency of credit systems have a direct impact on the allocation of credit risk and risk management in the financial sector, and consequently also influence the access to credit, credit as well as costs. As the world is streamrolling towards a fresh economic and financial crisis as a result of the pandemic, Governments around the globe will again be focusing on strengthening their credit environments. This brings me to the first challenge I want to identify, and that is the lack of progress on policy formulation aimed at improving the regulation of this field of our law. In my opinion, apart from the critical reforms that will be proposed by the panelists, the most glaring challenge would be to convince government to embark on a policy formulation process, drawing on leading international standards and guidelines. The question should therefore be asked whether we have an effective and efficient law reform system in place within the context of restructuring and insolvency law. My second observation is that although attention has been paid to the support of small businesses during the pandemic, Similar considerations have not been observed with regard to the insolvency and restructuring of small medium enterprises, the SMEs. The attention, however, should now turn from emergency funding initiatives to more structural law reform measures. SMEs, small businesses, undoubtedly are the lifeblood of economies, more so where the economies are emerging and developing. We can sometimes ask the question whether Chapter 6 is fit for purpose when it comes to SMEs. If you think of the corner, the coffee shop on the corner of the street with three tables, one waiter and one barista, the question or the answer to this question would often be no. It is too cumbersome and too costly. Lastly, the COVID-19 pandemic and subsequent lockdown measures resulted in procedural suspensions, but has also forced a lot of the legal services to leapfrog into the digital era. As a result of the pandemic, there's also an urgent need to implement technology in the area of restructuring and insolvency. The utilization of technology will speed up the process, as well as enable the reduction of cost of the proceedings and in turn expedite the buildup of capacity. An example would be to encourage e-filings, virtual creditor meetings, and promoting digital communication options, as well as utilizing data analytics techniques. In order to introduce certain 4IR concepts into law, policymakers will have to undergo a paradigm shift in their approach towards insolvency and restructuring law reform. To prepare for the exponential speed of the change that Industry 4.0 will introduce, even the way in which we are used to approach law reform will have to change in order to process and to observe to absorb these changes into the system. And yes, cost implications are always a key factor in deciding on ch changing or upgrading any legal framework. In my opinion, any legislative initiative that lands up in my inbox 
and has not undertaken an in-depth evaluation of the legal as well as the institutional framework to ensure that it is fit for purpose to support the digital transformation to Industry 4.0 would, in my opinion, already be outdated. Although introducing technology into the legal framework may be instrumental in improving service delivery, lawmakers will have to create a policy space to allow innovation to flourish, but at the same time to ensure that law and innovation are compatible. This is one area of the law, business rescue and insolvency law, where the law cannot afford to play catch up. The challenge facing architects of this new legal framework would be to design a simple and predictable system, which would be an accurate reflection of the present South African economic and social environment, while at the same time, same time safeguarding public interest and fostering international and local confidence. As we celebrate 10 years of business rescue, I can assure you that there have been lots of success stories. COVID has however highlighted the fact that we urgently need to investigate the possibility of special insolvency rules for SMEs, hybrid workout procedures, the facilitation of an effective discharge and put of debts for, debts for individual entrepreneurs, and it is necessary to take a holistic approach towards law reform and develop a modern and innovative framework. Um, and then as part of this process, include broader notions such as the changing nature of the law in the 4IR era, environmental principles, as well as sustainability. It gives, gives me great pleasure to now hand over the virtual microphone to Lero Kordi Muhale, which is also an alumnus of the faculty. And Lero Kordi will be discussing a day in the life of an attorney specializing in insolvency law and business rescue. Thank you, Lero Kordi. Prof, good morning. Thank you. Thanks very much. Good morning, everybody. Um, Prof Domingo mentioned a movie and everything else, and I thought, you know what, I'm going to just steal that, uh, that theme and just run with it. Um, business this year has oftentimes reminded me of the movie Titanic, where you, you, know, you get into this, uh, into this ship and uh, it's the best that's ever happened uh, in, in, in recent years. And this ship is going to take us from point A to point B, and it's just looking so awesome. It's designed in such a perfect manner everything is actually going to go well with this ship, with this, with this journey. And um, halfway, almost halfway, it um, starts sinking. And as it's about to sink, you literally have some who are deciding, should we jump off or should we just sort of move from the one part of the ship to the other part uh, with the hope that we're not going to sink anytime soon. And, you know, sometimes this rescue does, that does actually just give you that kind of feeling. Anyway, for purpose of today's discussion, I thought, let me just focus on four issues. Um, I, Again, one looking at sort of 10 years into business rescue um, and just looking at, at, at these four issues and, and, and I'm going to sort of discuss, uh, discuss them um, uh, uh, in turns. The first one is a pre-assessment that needs to be done by a business rescue practitioner. And the second one is um, a PCF. The third one is key creditors. Um, and then the last one is abuse of business rescue. Now let's just talk about the, the pre-assessment uh, very quickly. The law, as we all know it, is that a company may pass a resolution, the board actually pass a resolution to, to, for the company to voluntarily commence business rescue, and then file the resolution with CIPC. Within five days um, of thereafter, the company must then appoint a business rescue practitioner. And the same practitioner has to, within 10 days of his appointment, preside over the first meeting of creditors, where he must express a view on whether or not there is a reasonable press, a prospect of rescuing the company, okay? Now, the trigger word there is rescuing. You know, is there a, re a reasonable prospect of rescuing this company? And the meaning of rescue is that it's a restructure of the company. So in other words, is there a reasonable prospect of restructuring this company, i.e. restructuring its affairs, its business, its property, its debt, other liabilities, and equity? 
so as to achieve one of the one of the two objectives either to return the company back to solvency or to get a better return for creditors uh, or shareholders than would be the case in liquidation now i dare say that in order for one to make a comprehensive assessment and be able to get to the nitty gritties of the company and be able to get to a view that they can express at the creditors meeting on whether, on whether or not there's a reasonable prospect of a restructure that in most cases cannot be done in 10 days. And therein lies the importance of being able to, and in fact, doing a pre-assessment. In other words, doing this entire assessment of the affairs, the business, the property, the debt of the company prior to the company commencing business rescue. You simply just don't have enough time to do it in 10 working days. And oftentimes it's less than that. Now, the pre-assessment will entail anyone or all of the following. One, looking at the annual financial statements. Two, uh, going through the latest management accounts, going through cash flow projections, going uh, meeting with management so that you can be able to understand the business of the company. Oftentimes, oftentimes you may have to meet with a level or two below management because those are the people who are actually on the ground and they, they, they know which machines aren't working, uh, what the issues are with the employees and so on. Um, that will involve having a thorough understanding of the business of the company. That will involve going through the trade receivables and trade payables. That will involve going through the inventory list and actually checking whether or not those assets exist. It's, it's one thing to have this fancy thing drafted and signed off by auditors, but you've got to check if they actually exist. Um, and all of that just can't be done within, within, within 10 days. It has to be done before business rescue. And so in the next decade, you know, whether, whether it's in the context of the current uh, bull uh, trying to amend chapter six or, or at some point later on, but, but you've got to get to a point where it's, you know, even if it's not a legislative issue, but it certainly becomes a culture issue where we know that prior to business rescue, a practitioner is able to come in timelessly, do a pre-assessment so that by the time we file for business rescue, we know that indeed there is actually a prospect that this company can be rescued after having done that thorough exercise. Okay, otherwise what, what we are faced with currently um, is that business rescue is really seen by some people, if not, if not most people, as nothing but a precursor to, uh, to, to liquidation. Um, and that is fundamentally because a, a proper assessment is not being done to determine whether or not this company can in fact be rescued. Let's now focus on the issue of post-commencement finance. And it sort of links back to the issue of the pre-assessment. Now, as we know, post-commencement finance you know, can take either one of two forms. And I just want to focus on the one form. The one is unpaid remuneration payable to, to employees during business rescue. OK, I'm, I'm going to park that aside. I want to focus on the second one, which is where a company obtains financing from a lender uh, for, uh, during business rescue. Now. For any lender to advance PCF, uh, they would necessarily have to take an application for PCF to the credit committee and so on. And any credit committee, whether, whether, whether it's, a, it's a retail bank or any of the other um, FDIs, um, would, would, would look at three sort of common sense considerations in deciding whether or not to grant PCF. The first one is, is there an, is there an ability to pay? You know, will, will this money be repaid? Um, secondly, Will there be enough security for this money that you're about to advance? And then thirdly, ranking. In other words, um, ranking the, in, in, in business rescue vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis other creditors. Now, when this entire exercise is going on, i.e. somebody putting together an application for PCF, that application going to credit, that application being scrutinized, credit asking for information, and all of that, What's happening to this company that is already in business rescue? Oftentimes, uh, uh, the board will pass a, a, a resolution to place the company in business rescue literally at five to, at five to collapse. And so if you, now have, if you are now going to be going through days, if not weeks, of having to put together a, an application for PCF, finding PCF, knocking on different doors of the different lenders to, to, to try and find PCF, um, it may well be that by the time you get it, if you do get it, it's a bit too late. And therein lies the importance of a pre-assessment. Now, as much as we call PCF post-commencement finance, I would suggest that there's got to be 
a culture that needs to develop in the next decade of business rescue, where we actually view it as pre-commencement finance. And it's, 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 it's a term that I've just, I've, I've just I mean, it's, it's, not a, it's not a sort of legal term, but, 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 but in essence, where we look at this as financing that we try looking for and searching for and negotiating pre-commencement of business rescue. So that by the time business rescue commences, we would have done a proper analysis of the financial needs and what we need this money for and where the gaps are and how this money is going to be repaid and if there's security. So that way we are able to use business rescue effectively for purpose of preserving value and actually increasing the chances of being able to rescue a company. Then I just want to just move on to the next as, um, aspect and that's the aspect of what I call key creditors. Okay, again, it's not, it's, not, it's, not, it's, not, it's not a legal term. Now, what I mean by key creators, in, 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 in most business rescues, there'll always be that one or two or more creditors who say, will say to you, okay, you don't have to pay me. Let's see how you're going to rescue this company. For the simple reason, reason that they know that they are probably the only one in the industry. If not, the country can actually offer you a particular service or product that you need. I'll give a simple example. Um, a certain company went into business rescue. It was in the business of uh, manufacturing deodorants and all sorts of good things. But, but, but this company needs volumes and volumes and volumes of water to be able to, to actually produce the goods on a daily basis. It owed a whole lot of money to the Johannesburg, uh, Johannesburg Water. And Johannesburg Water simply said, okay, if you're not going to be paid me during business rescue, and you're not going to be paying me what I want you to pay me so that I can actually start supplying with water. I'm simply going to cut my water supply. And so you're effectively stuck with this creditor who, who, who is going to put a gun to your head, who is not interested in all sorts of sections of chapter six that you're going to be quoting to try and argue that, listen, you, you, you can't do this. And in fact, you, 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 you're trying to hijack the process. So we've got to find a way in which we're able to identify key creditors early and find a commercial way of dealing with them. So that, so that we don't find ourselves uh, uh, unable to rescue companies, not because we really just don't have the, the financial uh, um, uh, ability to do so, but simply because there's that one creditor on whose service or goods we like 100% rely. And there's just no way that we are able to get any, any service from them other than by paying whatever money that they're demanding. So the act unfortunately doesn't sort of allow us to uh, uh, sort of effectively and in a, in a very commercially effective way uh, de deal with these key creators. But um, it, it has to be something which every practitioner has to bear in mind to say, you are potentially going to find that there's that one creditor or two creditors that are going to put a gun to, the, to your head and they will simply want things done their way um, uh, uh, and knowing very well that there's just no way that this company can operate without their service and without their good. Now, at this point, I, I, I sort of don't, don't have a sort of legal solution to it, but, but it's something which practitioners need to bear in mind as a commercial reality to say, you will be faced with these things. And in fact, they keep happening. And we, we, we just need to just come up with a commercially practical solution each time. But bear in mind that there are those key creditors in every person's rescue. The last aspect I want to just focus on is the issue of abuse of business rescue abuse of business rescue. Now, and, 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 and the courts have, have actually sort of woken up to this and they are just not impressed all the way up to the SCA, where you find that, and, and this, this, happen, this happens quite often, you find that there is a debt owing by the company, legal proceedings uh, commence, and there's eventually a judgment, usually by default, granted against the company. Um, and instead of just this debt being paid, it's, it's not paid, there's just no negotiation, there's not, there's, not, there's not even an attempt to try and pay it. And then one day when the sheriff is about to attach some property or when the sheriff is actually about to now proceed with a sale uh, on auction to try and sell the, sales, uh, the, the, the property of, um, of the company uh, a day before the sale, you then get the board sitting and then actually passing a resolution to place the company in business rescue. Now, if we just, if we just sort of go two steps backwards and we just look at the basic principles of business rescue. And the first principle is the board may resolve to place the company in voluntary business rescue. It's, it's, it's something which they, 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 it's sort of a discretion that they may, they may exercise, but, but you know, subject to making sure that there is financial distress, 
and there's a reasonable prospect of rescuing the crew. Now, at all times, one has to be able to tick the box and say, is there financial distress, i.e., is there a possibility that, um, or, or rather, is it, does it appear reasonably unlikely that the company won't be able to pay its debts as they become due and payable in the next six months? Alternatively, um, uh, is, is it reasonably likely that the, 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 the liabilities will exceed assets? Okay. Secondly, is there a reasonable prospect that this company can be rescued, i.e., can its assets, can its debt, can its business be restructured so as to get it back to solvency? Nowhere there does it say that you may use business rescue to basically avoid liability. And that's quite frankly what has happened a few times. And it has just left a very bad taste in, um, in, in, in certain people, even on the bench, um, when it comes to business rescue. And, and recently, you know, judgments are coming out, even, even at, the, at the SEA, where, where, the, where the courts are simply saying, listen, uh, business rescue, you, you can't file that resolution in bad faith. Um, you know, once, once on the facts, the court sees that you simply file this resolution in bad faith to avoid liability, purely to frustrate a creditor's entitlement, um, the courts will set aside that, that resolution. And so, um, you know, in, in the next de decade of business rescue, we have got to avoid uh, 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 using business rescue as a way of stopping sales and execution, stopping banks from perfecting their security because they're entitled to. Uh, we've got to avoid uh, putting companies that, that are just hopelessly insolvent. There's just no way that they can be rescued, putting them into, 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 um, into business rescue. So just to, just to summarize, just to summarize, um, one, the issue of a pre-assessment We've got to just try and promote it as, as a culture in the industry to say before you accept appointment and before you accept appointment as a practitioner, go through a thorough pre-assessment to determine whether can this company actually be rescued? What's going on? What are the issues? Is it really in financial distress? Um, uh, secondly, to the extent that PCF is required, and it often is, that search for PCF and discussions for, uh, in relation to PCF and negotiations and signing and, 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 and sort of identifying the uh, but quantifying what uh, PCF amount, all of that needs to happen prior to filing for business rescue. Um, it's, it's, not, it's, not, it's not a legal requirement, but it's a commercial reality that we are faced with. Otherwise, we are just making a mockery of business rescue repeatedly. The third, the third one is identify key cre uh, creditors in, in a business rescue and start finding a commercial way of dealing with them so that, um, so that they don't sit there putting a, 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 a gun against your head um, um, and and, and as, as they do so, you're busy quoting all sorts of sections in, in chapter six, which quite frankly, they would not be bothered by. Um, and then lastly, if we can just uh, sort of in the next decade of business rescue, avoid abusing business rescue, let it be really a genuine manner in which we try and restructure companies that can be restructured, restructured and not a way of um, uh, frustrating creditors who are trying to exercise their rights. Rob Collins, back to you. Thank you. Thank you, Lerhudi, for that glimpse into the life of an attorney on the deck of the Titanic. I now hand over to Lizelle, which is also, she's also a very good friend of the faculty. Um, and Lizelle will be discussing some of the challenges experienced by an advocate in the field of business rescue and insolvency. Thank you, you and Um Yes, I think, unfortunately, due to the nature of my job, I deal more with the bad and the ugly than the good. But um, that being said, I've, um, I haven't been shy to say that I am an absolute fan of business rescue and its processes, no, notwithstanding the challenges that we face on a daily basis. Um, I still think that it is business rescue plays an integral part and can continue and should continue to play a very, very big part in the economy and in particular, given the fact that we need to resuscitate and recover from um, a couple of um, setbacks, um, I think it does have a very important role to play. Now, there are two issues for me that stands out, um, rather say challenges. And the one for me is in which we deal with and that we grapple with basically daily is 
disputed claims in business rescue. Now, a creditor with a disputed claim um, in business rescue is a challenge because it takes time and it costs money to adjudicate on a disputed claim. Now, the Act is not very helpful because it doesn't even tell us what and define a creditor. Um, but I want us to remember or just remind ourselves that a disputed claim is, and the litigation on a disputed claim is not only akin to a business rescue process. Um, after a hundred years of insolvency, um, of the insolvencies laws, we still have disputed claims. And yes, we can and we do borrow a lot from the mechanisms that are in place um, in, the, in dealing with these types of disputes um, in business rescue. If in a liquidation scenario, if I can just draw the analogy, a creditor with an unliquidated or a damages claim also cannot merely prove its claim at the first meeting of creditors. Even when a company is in liquidation, it is faced with um, scenarios where it needs to litigate because there's a creditor who needs to prove their claim. So I want us to remember that this is not something that is just because of the, 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 the bad and the ugly of business rescue, how we grapple with um, disputed claims. Now, why is it important um, to deal with, or, or why is disputed claims such a big challenge? Well, for a business rescue practitioner, he or she needs to know what voting interest will be um, given to that specific creditor, if anything. Um, and then for the creditor, ultimately, he or she needs to do and act in their best interest to, at the end of the day, obtain uh, some form of a dividend or a recovery out of the business rescue process. Now, I'm not talking about a where we have an unskilled um, business rescue practitioner or unscrupulous business rescue practitioner, um, where a business rescue practitioner comes into a company, he or she looks at the books and records of the company, and from those financial statements, it determines who are creditors and who are not creditors. Now, more often than not, the disputed claim would be a portion of a creditor's claim. For example, what you still get is, or not what you do get in business rescue is the moment a company is in business rescue, creditors do get anxious, rightly or wrongly so, but it's understandable. And a creditor needs to submit its claim. So the BRP will look and say, company owes creditor A a million rand. The creditor will then come and submit a claim for 2 million rand. And more often than not, it's that portion that are disputed. Now, again, to draw the analogy back to insolvency law, you more than often get where a creditor will submit the claim and it will have some form of an unliquidated portion to that claim. For example, penalties. Now, a business rescue practitioner looking at the books and records of a company, seeing that this is what a creditor A is owed, is faced with a situation where he or she cannot necessarily um, adjudicate or consider that claim. If there's a lot that needs to, factors that needs to be taken into account, a lot that needs to be adjudicated on before he or she can simply admit that claim. And it is in those circumstances where business rescue practitioners have tried to find a practical solution of how to deal with that. You will see in most business rescue plans nowadays, we get two things. One is that a business rescue practitioner bestows on themselves the power to 
adjudicate a claim. And when I say adjudicate, it's the preliminary adjudication. It's akin to what we see um, in, a, in Section 4.4 of the Insolvency Act, where the business rescue practitioner says, you as the creditor well, for your disputed claim or the portion that I dispute, come to me, show me as you would do at a first meeting of creditors or, or a second meeting of creditors and present to me on affidavit provide, with supporting documentations and vouchers or satisfy me that you do have this claim. The business rescue practitioner will go through that preliminary step and then say, actually, in fact, I can see that I'm satisfied that you do have a claim and I'm prepared to accept the claim. Alternatively, the business rescue practitioner will reject that claim. And then that's where the second leg comes in. The practical solution that we see um, nowadays is that there's, a, uh, there's provisions for alternative dispute resolution that either a calculation expert or an arbitrator gets appointed uh, to adjudicate on this claim. Although most plans do say that it should be on an expedited basis, it still takes a lot of time. The difficulty is the cost and the time um, of these disputed claims, and in particular when the claim is either a very large claim or it is su such a big claim that, as we call it, it's a swing vote. So the mere fact of whether or not that claim is accepted or rejected, that creditor will have a big say um, and actually the ultimate say when the plan is put and published for vote. Now, again, this is not something that is only um, which we in South Africa are struggling with. In um, the United States, um, they have a process with which they call a um, estimated claims process. Now, when I was reading up on this, I, uh, I came across a determination in, in, in the California court where the court said, um, and I actually want to read it to you, where the court said that, that were the court to wait for the final adjudication of this claim, it would materially retard the process of the case and frustrate the reorganization efforts of the company. And this was in 2002, after chapter 11 has been in, um, in operation and in effect for many, many, many years. So it's not akin to that. But then further in the United States in 2019, there was a proposal and I think the act was in fact promulgated for, um, it is called small business, um, the Small Business Reorganization Act. And the purpose of that act was specifically to add to Professor Carlitz's comment at the beginning to say that, what about SMEs? They are struggling with the timing and the cost. Um, they are the organizations that actually struggle the most. So the purpose of that enactment of that specific act um, was, and that, that's what the preamble says, it says that it's for to expediting bankruptcy procedures and economically resolve small business bankruptcy cases. So we do need to, in the meantime, find practical solutions, which we'll touch on, but then ultimately we do need to go further and go back to the good old, where we, where we make recommendations, we lobby, and um, we, we, we try to um, find um, not only practical solutions, but law amendments and, and, and reform. So what are the two, for me, there are two practical, or well, two solutions to the problem of disputed claims or dealing with this disputed claims. I think the most practical and the, for the immediate future, it is to continue with expedited arbitrations. Um, but I do want to put a proviso on that, that it is not necessary in particular, or in most cases, to get the most senior of senior 
people to adjudicate and to make a final determination. I don't think that um, there's, there's a handful, and I see it in most business rescue plans, we, 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 and rightly so, but they, I think there should be two categories. There should be a category for claims which are complicated and disputed, where we do propose appointments of retired judges and senior counsels. But I do think that in the smaller and less complicated issues, where most times it's actually just a number crunch, where we don't have to necessarily go through um, an arbitration in the true sense, where we can actually appoint an expert or a, or a, um, or a, a bean counter to do the determination of those um, claims. Then a, a solution which I think we should look in, in the future is the company's tribunal does have um, powers to determine certain disputes relating to companies. Um, usually, and it's nowadays it's for AGMs and for um, misuse of names and reservations of names. But the tribunal is there, it's operative, it's um, effective sometimes more so than other times, but it's a free service. So I think it is important to go and explore whether the tribunal cannot perhaps assist in um, extending its powers to deal with um, disputed claims in business rescue, even if it starts only to limit it and it limits its scope, like the small claims court does, to say we've got you, all claims disputed up to a certain amount gets adjudicated by, by um, the tribunal. I do think it's something which can be done and um, which will certainly be a very cost-effective way, in particular for SMEs, um, to do. Then the second thing, very quickly, that um, I do think is a challenge and an, and an interesting debate is the business rescue practitioner's obligation and powers, um, or limited powers, to investigate the affairs of a company. Now, in the industry, most people compare this investigation and say, but there's no investigation in business rescue proceedings akin to what we find in a liquidation through a 415 or a 417 inquiry. Now, I think the reason for that is quite clear um, from the reading of the Act and then also for the purpose of business rescue. Now, the reading of the Act, I say so, because if you look at Section 141, it says that the business rescue practitioner must investigate the affairs of the business and the properties and its dealings and everything. And then the last sentence is very important. It says, after having done so, consider whether there is any reasonable prospect of the company being rescued. So the primary objective and purpose for the business rescue practitioner investigating the affairs for purposes of complying with section 41411 uh, is to make up or to conclude, which he must do at the first meeting as well as the second meeting and say, I still believe that there is a reasonable prospect of this company being rescued. That's the primary purpose. But the second um, purpose that we need to, and then it's, sorry, it goes on to say that if there's any evidence, avoidable dispositions, um, avoidable transactions, or reckless trading or fraud, there are certain steps that the business rescue practitioner must take, and he must direct the management of the company to do so. Now, the reason for that is, as the, literally the decade-old saying goes, is business rescue is a forward-looking process. It's not looking backwards. You take the company's current situation and you see how can you restructure its affairs to let it proceed either on a solvent basis or to give creditors the best outcome that it can. Now, we must also remember, as Judge Brunt said as far back as Oak Dean decision, that business rescue is not there to avoid the consequences of liquidation. It is there to restructure the company and to give it a way forward. But if that can't be achieved because of certain conduct that can simply not be excused. 
I don't think it's 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 the, the duty of the business rescue practitioner to go over and beyond than what he is required to do to investigate, to report on that, and then do his job to find a plan together with the creditors to move this company forward. Now, how do we deal practically with inquiries and, and this, this investigation in business rescue? Um, business rescue practitioners do to the extent that they can, and there are funds available or a creditor is happy to do so, do appoint forensic auditors or for forensic people to do and have a look and investigate the affairs of the company. That report is made available and he can then deal with whatever needs to be done in the business rescue plan. And we do see that, that business rescue practitioners report on the findings in the plans. But what we've also done in one or two business rescues is we say, look, let's rescue the company. Ultimately, the rescue would be that the company is sold as a going concern or it is uh, its assets is sold and creditors are paid and creditors are compromised. But there's a provision in the plan that says that creditors' claims are preserved, even if it's one rand or a portion of, of it, specifically for the purpose that once the company, once the business rescue has been implemented, the company can be liquidated, creditors will retain a claim, and they can then proceed with whatever inquiry they want to um, in a liquidation scenario. So I do think that we need to remember the purpose of why investigations are done. And then specifically for business rescue practitioners, be reminded that what is the function? If you can't rescue the company because there are so many irregularities, business rescue should not be there to avoid the consequences of a liquidation. And I think if we remember that, uh, we can, for, even from a practical perspective, um, move forward and draw a line between when and where these inquiries um, should take place and what the limits of those inquiries sh should be. I think that is all from me. I think we can go on on these two topics for, for quite some time, but I, um, yeah, I'll hand over to Professor Carlitz. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lizelle. I appreciate that. Um, and yes, I agree. That is definitely a topic for, a, for an upcoming webinar on its own. So Kathleen, last but not least, and she needs no introduction, um, I hand over to my colleague here at the law faculty, Professor Kathleen van der Linde. Thank you, Yonita. I just can't see myself. Oh, yes, now I can. Um, I think um, to keep with the movie um, theme, I'm probably um, talking to you now from the ivory tower on the Titanic, if it has one. Um, but I think uh, one of the important things is that uh, I, I was just thinking about what Liratori said about the, um, the commercial pressure that creditors can exert and that the need for um, making arrangements for essential creditors. And it's not really something that is impossible for the law to address. And um, it's exactly the theme of my um, presentation this morning is that uh, law reform can actually address some of the very dire practical difficulties with business rescue. Now, business rescue in South Africa, of course, has two possible um, outcomes. The one is the continuance of the business um, as a going concern, and the other one is just simply a better return for creditors and or shareholders than would be possible in an immediate liquidation. So I say in both instances, regardless of which of these two objectives um, uh, are at play, continuance of the business at least for a short while until it can be sold is an important part and if you look at the provisions on business rescue you can see that it actually envisages that the business will be continued after the start of business rescue and um, one of the problems is indeed that key creditors can stop supplying the company and basically hold it to ransom so um, overall, if you look at uh, modern rescue systems in other jurisdictions as well, we see that they very often try and create an option for a company to get rid of onerous contracts. Sometimes onerous contracts are actually the reason why the company is in financial distress. On the other hand, we see that those same systems also 
provide for the continued supply of certain goods and services or um, yeah, the continuance of contracts and make some special arrangements that actually detract from the normal um, position in contract law. So modern business rescue systems basically allow some interference with the principle of contracts must be kept or Pacta Servanda suit. But what is very important, it tends to balance that by then protecting those who are continuing to supply a company um, in um, business rescue or, of course, also in liquidation. So, um, and some of them go very far to, to protect those post commencement suppliers. In the UK, uh, the insolvency practitioner actually has to guarantee um, the payment of those um, supplies. So, in South Africa, We've now already seen that um, many, we've seen a number of cases. We've had 10 years of cases. So initially there wasn't anything and now we've got a lot of cases and very important um, judgment um, in the Murray case where the court basically um, set out the general principles applying to contracts that are continuing after the commencement of business rescue, um, as well as continuing contracts, contracts that started before the beginning of business rescue and then continue afterwards, or contracts that in their entirety still have to be performed after business rescue. Um, and the main um, problem in South Africa is in many cases, and I'm not going to deal with their names now, we see that companies in business rescue are being evicted from rental premises, um, the goods, uh, machinery and um, trading stock um, are being repossessed by the um, other contract party, that essential services are um, cut off, that franchising agreements are cancelled and that the business then simply finds itself in the position where it cannot continue trading. And if that was the idea to restore the company to solvency, um, or to at least maintain its value by, con by being able to sell it as a going concern, um, th that possibility is ruined by these um, contractual measures um, that creditors rely on. Um, in the UK, um, and in fact, I'm glad, Liratori, that you mentioned um, ransom, because in the UK, there was a lobby group that said that 14% um, of liquidations could be prevented if companies in rescue could force their creditors or other contract parties to continue supplying on pre-commencement terms. So 14% of the liquidations, and we do have many liquidations result, uh, you know, following on um, business rescue. Um, that was their estimation. And they called their paper, Holding Rescue to Ransom. And they, of course, refer to these very, um, uh, problems that Liratori raised. So in South Africa, um, we find that creditors often want to cancel these contracts. And I think it's not only because of the legal position. Um, obviously, there's a lot of skepticism. They are uncertain of exactly where their um, claims will rank. Um, and I mean, that's a completely justified um, doubt because it's still unclear. Um, sometimes they um, you know, they've seen many instances where business rescue was being abused. So um, creditors very often try and cancel the contract as fast as possible. Just to get back to the uncertainty about their claims, it's uncertain whether if the company is in business rescue and a creditor in terms of a pre-existing contract, say for example, a landlord, um, keeps on supplying the company, whether those payments for the periods after the commencement of business rescue, whether they actually form part of pre-commencement claims, whether they are post-commencement claims, um, as in part of the cost of um, business rescue, that was the case with um, liquidation, and that's of course, uh, also, it was also the case with judicial management, is that any payments for continued supply for water, electricity, for um, rent, would actually form part of the costs of liquidation. So does it also form part of the cost of business rescue or is it post commencement financing? Because the cost of business rescue is ranked first, then come the employees and then only the other post commencement financing. And we still don't know where exactly those claims would um, rank um, in the order of uh, in business rescue. 
so um, what the Companies Act does, and it's good that it has given attention to um, uh, unexecuted or continuing contracts, is um, in section 1362, it says that the business rescue practitioner has the power to suspend any obligation of the company that has not yet fallen due. And that's, of course, an obligation in terms of a contract that existed before the business rescue proceeding started. So any pre-existing contracts, if the company still has obligations that only fall due during business rescue, the business rescue practitioner can suspend those obligations before they fall due, because the act says obligations that would otherwise have fallen due. So you have to suspend them in time. It might be that by the time that the business rescue practitioner takes over, many of these obligations might already have fallen due, and then they can no longer be suspended. Um, the other alternative to suspension is that the business rescue practitioner can approach the court to cancel those obligations, but still it's only obligations that will still fall due in the future, so they can be cancelled. And then in exchange for that, the other party only has a claim for damages. We also don't know where exactly that claim for damages ranks, but I don't want to spend too much time on that. So I think initially our creditors thought that this was a very draconian provision. And of course, um, in the, one of the bills, it was in fact more draconian, but people still think that the one in the current companies act is very draconian. And I don't think it is. Um, people thought that it was very powerful. And I think business rescue practitioners discovered to their surprise that it wasn't such a great power after all, and that it um, really, uh, gives very little protection to the company and is not entirely bad news for the other contract party. So um, some business rescue practitioners, of course, immediately when they take office, they suspend all um, obligations of the company that will still fall due. They sometimes even try to suspend some retroactively, but of course that's not possible. But the bottom line is that by suspending the company's obligations, company or the business rescue practitioner cannot force the other contract party to continue supply. They tried that. They said, we've suspended our obligations. You are not allowed to suspend the credit facilities. You are not allowed to evict us. You are not allowed to um, do anything because we've suspended our obligations and you have to continue supplying. The court's very um, soon made, uh, you know, uh, said that that's not the case. You cannot force the other party to continue supplying. You can only suspend the obligations of the company. So the only effect is that the other party can no longer get an order for specific performance. They only have a, a claim for damages, but they can stop supplying. This is in terms of the general principle of our contract law. Most contracts in our law are reciprocal contracts, so the obligations or performances are undertaken in exchange for each other. So if this party is not performing, then the other party can refuse to perform. Um, party has to tender performance before it can force another party to perform. So by suspending an obligation, you are not um, uh, tendering performance and therefore the other party can refuse to perform. What business rescue practitioners also um, found out is that um, they cannot really prevent the cancellation of contracts. Um, so there are three circumstances that we have to look at. First of all, it could be that the company was already in default when it entered business rescue. Clearly, our courts have said that um, in terms of normal contract law, such a contract could still be cancelled. Secondly, um, if the company defaulted after the commencement of business rescue, but in respect of an obligation that has not been suspended, clearly the other party can still contract, uh, cancel the contract. The third scenario is where the other party is now trying to cancel the contract on the basis of the non-performance of a suspended obligation. We don't know yet what the legal position is, but in a Murray case, the court said, arguably in that case, the other party cannot cancel. But if there's any other reason for the other party to cancel, it can still cancel. But if the only problem is that the company has suspended certain obligations, the court said, well, 
that's one of the ways in which you can protect yourself. But that was not part of the ratio of this case. It was really an, um, just an aside or incidental remark. So we'll have to see when the right case presents itself. But in most of these cases, the company was already in default before the time and it just continued occupying premises, for example, without paying. So, um, and the third problem is uh, this, uh, even the moratorium, the Companies Act says, if um, a company is in business rescue, then you cannot take legal proceedings against it or enforcement action. Initially, in some of the early cases, the argument was that um, cancellation of the contract would amount to uh, legal proceedings and therefore could only take place with the permission of the practitioner or with the consent of the court. And the courts also rejected that argument. And in addition, they adopted a very narrow interpretation of the moratorium. So it might be that a party can cancel the contract, in order to give effect to that cancellation, they do in fact need legal proceedings. We know that is the case with eviction, for example. You cannot just tell the other party to leave. If you cancel the contract, then you would still need a court order to evict that party. And then for that, we've got two lines of cases. The one line of cases said, but once the contract has been canceled, the company is in on the premises illegally and the property is no longer lawfully in its possession and therefore you don't need consent to lift the moratorium because you can just proceed with these legal proceedings. And then the other line of cases said it still falls under the moratorium, but we will look at the circumstances. And that is the um, solution I favor. Um, I think um, the moratorium clearly says it protects the company when you are acting against it um, on the basis of property that's lawfully in its possession. But it also the primary function of the moratorium is to protect the company when you are litigating against the company. And if you are trying to evict the company, you are still trying to litigate against the company. The um, part about the property in the lawful possession of the company was actually meant to extend the moratorium, not to narrow it. So that would also cover instances where you are not litigating against the company personally, but against somebody else in respect of company uh, property that's lawfully in the possession of the company. For example, in the case of um, rental uh, property or leased premises, if you are litigating against the owner of that premises um, that the company is occupying, you would also need to lift the moratorium. So the moratorium also as interpreted by the majority of the cases, doesn't go far enough. The big problem, I think, is this principle of reciprocity. That is exactly the thing that allows this ransom to happen. Because if the company is already in default, I can say, if it, I know that the company needs my um, supplies, I can say, well, unless you pay up all your arrears, or I'm not going to continue supplying. It's because of this uh, principle of reciprocity of contract. And I think that in our law, business continuance is not sufficiently facilitated. Another problem is uh, that also relates to these ransom um, payments or ransom conditions are um, ipso facto clauses. They've enjoyed a lot of attention abroad, but not really in South Africa. An ipso facto clause would be a clause that says, the minute you go into business rescue, this will be the terms of the contract it will be cancelled, the interest rate will increase, anything that's triggered automatically by the fact of business rescue. Um, so without the company defaulting on anything, the mere fact that it goes into business rescue can lead to the cancellation of the contract. In many other modern rescue systems, such clauses are outlawed. In South Africa, they have actually been not really recognized directly, but um, there are various cases where our courts made remarks to say that, you know, obviously if you had an ipso facto clause about judicial management, it will automatically apply to business rescue circumstances. So the indications are that our courts recognize these clauses. So again, without the company doing anything wrong, apart from going into business rescue, which it sometimes is forced to do, um, the contract can be cancelled or adjusted. Um, if I look at other jurisdictions, in the UK, for example, they've got specific uh, provisions forcing um, suppliers of, of public utilities and um, internet services and communication 
to continue supplying after the business, of, uh, well, their version of business rescue. So when the company goes into administration, these people still have to continue supplying. The insolvency practitioner has to guarantee those supplies. Um, he can, of course, also stop those contracts, but if he wants to continue, he has to give a guarantee that the company will perform, but only the post-commencement amounts. He doesn't have to make good any arrears, but as long as they say, from now on, we will continue paying, and then the minute that the company does not continue paying for the post-commencement supplies, the contract can, in fact, be cancelled and it doesn't fall under the moratorium. What they've also got for landlords is um, eviction is also subject to their moratorium. So if you want to evict somebody, they will, um, the court will have to decide whether you can do so. And usually the court would look at whether the company actually is intending to continue operating. If that is the case and it's using the premises, the court will not lift the moratorium. But if the company has not been paying, is not using the property, is going to sell its business in any case, then the court would lift the moratorium and eviction can take place. Um, in Germany, they've got an even, I think, better solution. They attack or, or adjust this principle of reciprocity. And they basically say, we are going to um, divide this contract up in two parts. The part before business rescue started, for that you are just an insolvency creditor or a business rescue creditor, a pre-commencement creditor. Um, you cannot use that as a condition for continued supplies. The practitioner can decide, can force a creditor to continue supplying. So all essential creditors, the practitioner can say, well, you have to continue supplying us. We will pay you your post-commencement um, contract price, but you cannot um, insist that we first clear historical arrears. So this, may, uh, the, the upshot of this is that the other contract party cannot use, um, cannot hold the rescue to ransom by insisting on the um, pre-commencement um, arrears. And then they do protect those people who have to continue supplying, they are not subject to the moratorium, so they can take any legal steps. So the minute that you don't comply with your post-commencement uh, uh, obligations, then the normal contract rules apply and the contract can be cancelled and so on. Um, I've looked at the amendment bill, um, and I think that's perhaps where the ugly comes in. Um, the amendment bill tries in some way to address a little part of this problem. The South African Property Owners Association at one stage said that, uh, you know, landlords might even have to pay for water and electricity and then they don't, don't get any rent from the um, company in business rescue. So they are actually having to pay amounts out of their own pocket whilst they cannot recover that from the company. And companies, of course, um, wanted to uh, continue occupying the premises without paying because they say they've suspended the obligations. So, um, sorry, I hope I'm back now. Um, the amendment bill only deals with um, contracts of lease um, between a company and a landlord. And it says that the landlord will get special protection um, for any amounts that the landlord has to pay towards public utilities, water, electricity, and so on. Mm. And so those amounts will form post-commencement financing and will rank ahead of other claims. So it will rank immediately after the employees, which again is a problem because if other contracts rank as part of the costs and these amounts only after the employees, then landlords are actually in worse situation mm. than other creditors. So the pr problem is that um, I don't think that these uh, that the new amendment bill goes far enough. Um, I think what we really need is law reform. First of all, the courts can do a lot. If we look at liquidation, the entire liquidation um, contract dispensation is not based on statute. The general principles have been developed by the courts, saying that we've got a, a concursus creditorium, a general body of creditors, and as a result of that, you cannot do this or you can do that. 
so they could have already said that certain creditors couldn't in, uh, exercise their cancellation rights because it would hamper the continuance of the company in business rescue. I think we definitely need statutory intervention, at least for essential contracts. And then I think the legislation should also adjust this um, reciprocity principle so that a distinction can be made between pre-commencement um, contract breach and post-commencement situation. So um, I think the good is that we have a provision in the act, we've gained a lot of clarity um, creditors are really protected. The bad is that I think the company is somewhat underprotected in relation to certain contracts. And yeah, or maybe just for today, I'll say the ugly is that the proposed amendment does not go far enough, but there's still um, an opportunity to comment on the amendment bill until the end of this month. So I hope you will do so if you agree with me. Thank you, Janita. Thank you, Kathleen. Yes, I've also now touched up on my um, contract principles and um, learned a lot. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, I only received one question via WhatsApp, interestingly enough, and um, the person know me well. And the question is directed at myself. Um, if you um, are of the opinion that the law reform process is not sufficient, how would you remedy this? I think it's key that um, we enter into dialogue. I think consultation is key. I think we should consult with practitioners, first and foremost, that we should be lobbying and um, continue to lobby for a, 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 a team of, 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 of um, I don't want to call them experts, but a team that would look into various aspects of law reform. And that would include policy reform, policy discussions, um, look at the cost of the, the reform, and then obviously um, think of ways in which we could change the course of the Titanic, as, as, as we've mentioned. Um, if we look at the UK, the new Insolvency Act in the UK, the Corporations Insolvency and Governance Act of 2020, it is interesting to note the key role that the regulator played in the law reform process to bring about um, very um, sufficient law reform in the UK. So the time that they took to actually implement this act is, is astonishingly um, a very short, uh, in a very short space in time. So, um, and also if you look at India and the new, uh, relatively new bankruptcy code in India, it also took them almost 18 months to get everything in place. So I think, um, yes, in my opinion, um, lobbying would, would definitely be key to get the government to, to actually realize and to acknowledge that we urgently need to have a revamp of, of chapter six. But in, in saying that, um, I think it should be a joint effort taking hands, practitioners, lenders, regulators, academics, um, um, in coming up with a solution. And um, yeah, with that, I want to ask everybody to switch on their cameras so that I can actually thank each one of you. Um, I want to thank my panel um, for the time. Um, I really do appreciate Colleagues, has Juanita frozen or is it only from my side? Yeah, I think she has, Prof. Uh, perhaps Prof. Uh, von Linde on her behalf? Yes, okay. Let me continue. I think um, they often have power interruptions. Juanita, if you're back, please take over again. I would like to thank our alumni, um, Lizelle and Liratori, for um, uh, joining us in this um, webinar as panelists. And um, thank you also to everybody at the faculty who um, arranged this. I don't know if there are any questions, but I think we should, um, we can conclude. Thank you very much to Yonita, even though we can't see or hear her at the moment. And thank you to Professor um, Domingo for also uh, welcoming everyone. Finally, ladies and gentlemen, thanks for taking the time to join us in this webinar. And um, I hope we'll have um, similar 
events in the near future. Professor Domingo, do you still want to say something? I frightened her, I think. This is what makes us realize how old we are if we see our old students um, uh, as panelists in, uh, in, a, in a webinar. But it was good seeing you all. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. I'm going to end the session now. Have a lovely day further. Thanks, bro. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye.